Mel and Jay back again, and this time we're going to look at what we said earlier. I've still got the same shirt in you, right? I haven't washed it. I probably am smelling to high heavens, but we need to get through this, plug this through. As long as I'm wearing the shirt, you know what we're talking. We're talking about that map. We're talking about Ur. We're talking about Haran. We're talking about that low northern area in southern Turkey and how that this could be where the original Mecca was, or at least the name for the original Mecca. Uh, and now let's go through and let's look at a timeline because some of the people are asking, can you show this on a map? Can you show us on a time scale what we're talking about? And I think it would be good if we did that, if we just go through each one of the dates. And uh, you've, you've picked out a number of dates that are important. 602, you've picked out 617, 622, 624, and 634. Could we look at those dates and unpack each one of those dates so people understand the sequence that you're going back and then you end up with 636, the last one. So 602, yeah. 616, 617, 622, 624, 634, and 636. Let's go with each one one at a time. Over to you, Mel. Absolutely. Yeah, so just the first thing just to point out is I'm going to be showing you how my Iraqi Persian thesis corresponds to Dan Gibson. So there will be a gap in my thesis where Dan Gibson's thesis takes over, if you like. So 602, um, is connected to Al Hira. So we have the guy Ias ibn Kabisa al Tayi. He was given the title or nom de guerre of Muhammad later, but he's appointed in that year as co governor of Al Hira with a guy called Nakhiragan, who was a Persian. We don't know where exactly he was born. Um, this Iyas guy. Can, can I just interrupt real quickly? What you mean, and yeah. just so people know, when we use the name Iyas ibn al Kabisa al Tayi, his nom de guerre or his nom, his nickname is Muhammad. Okay, yeah. that's why you're saying this is the Muhammad that uh, that is then at then is then uh, you lift it out and then replaced to the Muhammad of the uh, by the traditions. So, but his yeah. his nickname is Muhammad. Okay, but we're yeah. calling him Iyas because that's his formal name. But Muhammad yeah. would be the nickname that we're referring to. Yeah. And the, the reason behind uh, identifying as Iyas is the fact that the early sources refer to the Tayyaye of Muhammad. And the leader of the Tayyaye at that time was this guy, Iyas. So this is why we can say this is the, the person. Okay. Now, I don't know where he was born. Um, there are suggestions that he was of mixed heritage. He could have been from uh, one parent might have been Arab, another parent may have been Persian. Um, that's an area for further research. Um, there was a book written a couple of years ago in Arabic, which was called um, Islam was, I think it was Islam was uh, created in Persia. Um, and in that book, he, the, the author suggests that this very thing that uh, I think it was the father's Persian, the mother was Arab. So that might explain this mixed identity that we seem to see in the sources. So moving on from there then, in 617, the Lachman And just ruler, for those who know, let's look at a map. Where is Hira? So we know where it is. Can you see where Al Hira is? It's real close to what is today Baghdad, just a little south of what is today Baghdad. Back then it would have been called Stesiphon. Yeah. So in 617, the Lachman ruler, Iyas ibn Kabisa, was ousted from Al Hira by Azad Bey, and his Parsiks, which it was a particular ruling class in Persia. And so the idea is that after being ousted, this would have led to him wanting to um, plot his revenge. Now, it's interesting, the early sources, strongly influenced by, uh, by the Islamic rulers, paint him as being still a friend of the Persians, still fighting on the Persian side. But if we think about this logically, there's no way someone who's been ousted would, would still be all friendly, lovey-dovey with the Persians. So it makes a lot more sense that this is the trigger point where he now becomes the enemies of the Sasanians. So here is the key starting point. Now it's a bit messy uh, for the next few years because there are different groups fighting against the Persians. They haven't yet united, but this is really the, the point at which um, he gets involved in all of this. He's a dutiful um, ruler for the Persians up to this point, but this is the moment where he, he decides that actually he's had enough um, and he's going to take the Persians on himself because he's interested in power. Uh, rulers don't like giving up power. And uh, mm -hmm. so, and he's the ruler of a tribe, so he's got a lot of clout behind him. So he, he can do things, even if the Persians um, don't like it. Um, so the, the next key year in the timeline is 622. 
Now, th there's a number of things that have happened in that year which are important. First of all, Heraclius liberates Cappadocia, which is in Turkey. In the 660s, Sebius tells us that when Heraclius captured Edessa in 622, the Jews fleeing from Edessa or Ur, so Ur is appearing again, that the Jews met the Arabs in Tashkestan, which is northern Mesopotamia. They Jude Judaize the Is Ismailites into Hagarim, which essentially means that he rem they reminded the Arabs of their connections way back to Hagar and Ishmael. So they they get all fired up with the sort of the ancient theology about their their importance. Um, he also mentions that they meet Muhammad here. Now it's interesting that they're meeting Muhammad really not far from the old Mecca that we mentioned. So the old Mecca. Is, be, is just outside Ur on the way to Haran. The, they have been evicted from Edessa, or in other words, Ur, by the Byzantines. They're on their way to Babylon and along the route, which probably would have followed along the Euphrates River, it, Sebius tells us that they meet Muhammad there. So that's very interesting. So this is exactly where we'd expect, him, mm -hmm. expect the Jews to meet Muhammad considering our theory up to this point. So our theory is is based on factual information. Um, and so the Muslims watching really have to deal with the facts. The facts on the ground are telling us this is where Muhammad is when he first meets the Jews. Please explain to me why he's meeting Jews way up in Iraq when the tradition tells us that he should be way down in the Hejaz. Um, where there is no reference for Jews at all in the Hijaz. We can't find any historical support. No. The, er, the furthest south that we find any Jews is uh, what we call Medina Sali or Median Sali, which is much, much further north. No Jews at all in Yathrib, no Jews. Well, there's no Mecca, so there's going be no Jews there, but there's no Jews in Taif either. They're much, much further north. So that, again, the historical evidence on the ground has the Jews in the wrong place for the traditions to be correct. Yeah. Now, the interesting no. thing is Sebius. So Sebius also says something uh, more about Muhammad when, when the Jews met him. He, he says that he gave rousing um, sermons of a, an Abrahamist flavor. So he's, he's an expert in the Mosaic law. So that fits in with what we know about him. He's, he's not illiterate. He's, he's very knowledgeable. But what he was able to do, and this is the key thing about his leadership qualities, is he was able to unite the clans. So the Jews are basically saying, we need to unite in order to, to mm. win victory. So he organizes a, a form of unity among all the different clans. And it's interesting, a later coin refers to this year as the year that the believers settled their case. So this is the year when the, the Jews, the Nestorians, and the Sabians, and the Abrahamists all come together as one unit to kick off the yoke of the Persians. That's, that's another reason why it's important. The one more thing, thing is, before you go on, before between 622, remember also that Heraclius liberates, destroys the Persians on this date. And this is probably the reason for many of the Arabs, who the Lakhmids and the Ghassanids, who did hated the Persians, uh, they, they, their oppressors are now in, thrown off, are been, have been defeated by the uh, Heraclius, who is an, uh, a Byzantine. He's a Christian, the Byzantine. And this would then help us understand why later, when the Abbasids do choose a date, why do they choose 622 for the, big, for the Hijra, for the beginning of their calendar, for the beginning of uh, what they would always say is the, the Islamic calendar. Until today, they still use 622. It's probably because of this point right here, and that is that the Arabs Absolutely. finally ca came into their own at this time. Just to remind people there, yeah. because 622 is significant when you're talking from an Arab standpoint, when you're talking about the, the eradication of all the suppression that has been gone on for so many centuries before that. This is when it stops. So can you yeah. see then why that they would choose this date? Okay, good stuff. That all just fits the piece. Now, 624. Okay, so this year has been suggested to me by um, a contact uh, to my um, channel called Joe. He suggested that this may be the year of Dukar. Now, I haven't looked into the reasoning behind this, his choice of this year. Um, there is scholarly dispute about the year, but this would fit perfectly if this was actually the year. So this is the year that Eas is said to finally have got his revenge against the guy who kicked him out of Hira, which is Azedbe. 
Um, and this occurred on the day of Dukar, which is just north of Hira, a few months after Badir in 624. Um, so it all fits to a piece. Um, if you remember 617, he was ousted from Hira. 624, the Battle of Dukar, he finally takes on this guy and wins the battle. So the conflict in reports that Eas or his son were on the Persian side is not consistent with him having been ousted. This is an important point. So it is, in short, a deliberate hazing of the facts invented to hide his true identity and the fact that he was indeed actually working for Kavad II at this time, which would be on the opposite side to the Persians. The Islamic tradition has Muhammad saying that victory was achieved through him. So they get that part right. But if the Islamic tradition is correct that Muhammad said uh, victory was achieved through him, that would make more sense if Eas was fighting against the Persians. It makes no sense if he's on the other side. So they have told a half lie in order to, <laughs> to disconnect him from Eas, but yeah. they didn't do a very good job. Um, and so we still can see what really happened from our sources. Now, so the other thing I would say is this is where Dan Gibson's um, theory comes into the into the frame. But this is where the two come together and uh, correspond. So from this point, it's probably likely that after having taken on the Persians, he retreated westwards to Petra, which is obviously a fantastic fortress area to 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 battle from. Regrouped, gathered gathered his troops, probably got additional troops, if you like, from Southern Arabia, and, and then starts hitting the Persians from different angles from there. Um, and uh, what's interesting is we next hear of Muhammad um, through a source from 640, Thomas the Presbyter. He reports of the Tayaye of Muhammad fighting the Romans 12 miles east of Gaza in 634. Okay, now, that's let's, let's, let's put a map up there and show you where we're talking about, because you can see Gaza is to the northwest. Uh, it's, way, it's even beyond further west than Petra. So wh wh uh, this would have Muhammad way over in the west now, which would make sense if he was headquartered in Petra. Yeah, absolutely. And this creates a lot of problems for Muslims, because the Islamic tradition says he died in 632. We can see clearly... He's now in Palestine. He's still alive. Um, 634. Six, three, four. So it's two years later. This is the, uh, the time when Abu Bakr supposedly is a caliph. Um, so that's a major problem. And um, there's also a, a, a reason, I think, behind why there is this anomaly. And that is when they were rewriting his story and they're trying to make him sound like Moses, they're using all the motifs of Moses, including the fact that Moses never entered the promised land and Joshua takes over. So he sees the promised land, but he dies before he enters Palestine. So they're trying to do that with the story of Muhammad. But what they weren't expecting is this diligent priest wrote this little note inside a book. It was locked away for centuries. No one knew about it. So if you imagine the Abbasids are writing these alternative histories, not knowing that this priest, Thomas the Presbyter, had written this note, which would be discovered centuries later, and blows a gaping hole in the Islamic narrative. This is, this is the reason why um, all of this early material is so exciting, because we can see clearly there's been a major cover-up, and we, we're seeing it video after video, just cover-up after cover-up, and uh, you know, Islam has, got an, has an issue that it will have to deal with. It will have to come clean. It will have to rebase its religion on historical fact because it's been hiding under the covers from this for too long. Um, they, they will need to face up to the historical details and, and just accept that this is the history. You can't create a mythology any longer. You've got to at least get your facts right. And then, okay, maybe the religion survives after that, but at least it would be faced it would be based on historical fact, not on uh, mythology. Okay, so Dan Gibson's material starts to appear in the 620s as well. So this would make sense as well. You can see the the uh, the, the Qiblatain Mosque is 620s. Uh, you also have the the mosque that is uh, facing towards Petra 
all the way over in Guangzhou in, in China, also the one in Sherman in India, in southern India and Kerala, that's also facing petrol. So they all start to appear from 626, 627, 632, six, uh, just, and that would fit exactly since that's where Muhammad Taye would be there by that time. Uh, but not that, and I would suggest that they were, that even earlier ones were probably that time, because at this time, th these would still be temples that became mosques. These would be Nabataean temples that became mosques. But thanks yeah. a lot. This has been terrific. What you have done is by, by placing it in a timeline, by putting it, the dates there, the timeline is there. Let me put the time up again. And there you can see in 620, uh, 602 is al Hira. That's when Ias was made governor of Hira. Uh, then we jump to 617. That's where Ias is then deposed. Uh, 622 is when Heracles comes and liberates Cappadocia. And that starts the identity for the... Arabs, because now they are out of the oppression of the Sassanians. In 624, you have the Battle of Dukar, uh, where this Muhammad, this Ilyas ibn Kabisa, has finally got revenge on the fellow that uh, threw him out there in Hira earlier in 602. And then he then moves to the west from that time. Possibly it looks like he's moving towards Petra. He moves in, and then he has this big battle in 634 in Gaza, even further west, and then dies in 636, according to Thomas the Presbyter. So thank you, this is terrific. Getting it on timeline helps us to understand what we're now, what history is now telling us, not what the traditions are telling us. Because remember, the traditions are ninth and 10th century. They don't even have the right place. They don't even have the right time. They don't even have the right man. <laughs> That's why it's so good to go back in history. Mel, you've got us the right man and you've got us now in a timeline to see how it all fits together. This does not confront what Dan Gibson is saying. It actually complements what Dan Gibson is saying. God bless you. Absolutely. It's so good to have you. Okay. This is Mel and Jay uh, uh, putting into a, yet another chapter and another nail that starts to go into this coffin. <laughs> God bless you. Do do your comments down below. Please get them in there. We need to see them. We need to need hear your reaction. And we'll haul Mel back again to answer your questions. <laughs> right. Mel and Jay, over and out. Mm -hmm.